when everybody jumped on that normally we do this just for COC board members, but we have quite a few new staff members who need the information as well. So this is you as a COC board member's orientation, your time for questions. I'm gonna debrief with staff tomorrow, um, but they're attending so that I don't have to present the same information twice. And we'll also send you a whole bunch of documents after this meeting, including the PowerPoint presentation. So you can just save that somewhere in your um, files or um, in your email, whatever is best for you. And you won't want to sit down and read all of that at one time. Um, I recommend just kind of saving it and referring to the documents as you need it. So why don't we start off with introductions? I'm Amy Foster. I am the CEO of the HLA. And um, I joined the team about a year ago, um, last December. And I served as a COC board member prior to becoming the CEO for six years. So I can kind of help you navigate things I saw from the board side, as well as help you um, in your current role. And let's go to Tawny next. I'm Tawny Swingcastle. I'm Director of Programs at the Homeless Empowerment Program. I'm on the board as a formerly homeless person. Thanks, Tawny. How about James? I'm James Kowalczyk. Um, Kathleen brought me on. Kathleen those, Beckman? Yeah, so for those who don't know, Kathleen Beckman is our representative for the city of Clearwater. And James, we are so excited to have you. Thank you. And James is a former veteran, so he is sitting in the veteran seat, also formerly homeless. Um, and so he's he's able to provide a couple different perspectives, just like uh, Tawny. So thanks for being here, James. Thank you. How about Ross? Hi, I'm Ross Silvers, and I'm a new COC board member. And um, I've been working with programs providing transportation for uh, agencies that serve the homeless and homeless individuals for about 10 years now through PSTA. Thanks, Ross. And we, that's a new seat we added this year. Um, we had an option of a workforce development seat or a transportation seat. And um, PSTA has been such a good partner in the past, we're really excited to have Ross's participation. So why don't we go to HLA staff members? I will have Olivia go next. Hi everyone, my name is Olivia. I am the new community navigator manager. So I'm super excited to see what you all do. Thanks, Olivia. I can't see everybody when I'm sharing my screen. So I'll do look well and then just have everybody else go after her. Hello, I'm Laquelle Powell, a new community navigator working with HLA. Hi, I'm Russell Morton. I'm a new veteran advocate here at HLA. I'm excited to see what we can do. Hi, I'm Denise Sparks, and I'm administrative assistant for Amy. Denise, or Shannon, I think you might be muted. Oh, it's still think I think your mic isn't working. Nope, still can't hear you. My I'll microphone. Go ahead, Shannon. We heard you for a second. Can you hear me right now? Yeah. All right, I had to undo everything from my computer and now I'm sitting at my desk. Hi everyone, I'm Shannon Walker, Director of Veteran Services at HLA. Just started in November and really excited to be a part of the team. And just wanna do a shout out to Jimbo. Thank you for being a veteran. And I'm also uh, formerly homeless as well. So thank you for all that you're gonna do for us. Okay, so I'm gonna share a lot of information um, trust me that do not feel overwhelmed. The um, system is quite complex, which anyone on this call who's navigated 
whether it's the homeless system or the mental health system, you're probably familiar. It's way more complex than it should be. That's why we have so many navigators on this call, because we have to have folks who help people understand how to make it through the system. Um, but again, this is just intended to give you some kind of overview. It's not all going to make sense at one time. It's going to take some time. Um, you know, you'll hear certain terms over and over again. One of the things I'm going to provide you after the meeting today is um, a glossary, which has um, definitions as well as acronyms. So, you know, feel free to stop me anytime when I use acronyms like the COC, which is here on the first page, um, and ask me to explain myself. Stop me at any time to ask questions. I know it's really hard to sit still in an hour and a half with a person just sharing and not having um, an environment where we're kind of going back and forth. So please don't hesitate to um, stop. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the continuum of care is. Um, this is a federal term um, that is something required by HUD. HUD is Housing and Urban Development. I um, mean, it provides the money in our system to help us end homelessness. So I like to describe the continuum of care as really a two-part thing. It's a program and a structure, and we're gonna talk about both parts of that. Um, but these are the overarching goals of what a continuum of care is supposed to do. So we promote a community-wide commitment to end homelessness. Yep, Tani? I was just gonna say, if you're sharing a screen, we're not seeing the screen you're sharing. Okay, so let's try that again, and you let me know if you can see it. This happens to me at work when I'm trying to do something with both screens. It keeps saying pause. Let me stop and share again. It says pause again. And I would talk you through it, but I had somebody in an office next door come and fix mine the last time, so I can't help you. Okay, let me try one more time. I'm the only host. Only the host can share, so that should not be causing it. Huh, I think somehow it is because of enhanced encryption. So let me try to do it this way. I am going to um, try to put it in the chat as a backup plan if we can't get this to work. And again, I'll send it after the meeting as well. Sorry about this, guys. <laughs> okay, if you open up your chat, you should be able to download or open it from there. And I'm gonna try again. Every time I share it, it just automatically pauses it and I'm not sure why it's doing that. You want me to try it on my end? You want to give me permission? Yeah, let's try that. Good problem solving, Tawny. <laughs> I can make you a co-host. If you, I think you can, under the security, you can just check the enable screen sharing. See if you're able, do you have it as an option now? I do. Okay. Now I just have to find that file. Hang on. <laughs> I, I appreciate your willingness to try and make this work. Mm. All right, let's see. 
Welcome, Chris. We are having some technical difficulties, so you haven't missed anything. If you want to do a quick introduction. Okay, thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for uh, the uh, let, letting me join late. Um, I actually wasn't able to go uh, to Dallas uh, like I emailed you about. So um, uh, anyway, yeah, I work uh, in the affordable housing industry uh, here with Raymond James. I've been uh, with them and in, in, in that industry for about eight years. And um, uh, it, it's been a great segment of commercial real estate to be in. Uh, my whole career has been in commercial commercial real estate. And um, I am a native to Tampa, went to Florida State. And uh, we essentially uh, finance, own, and operate uh, affordable housing developments throughout the United States. We uh, work in 48 states. and. Um, uh, it's just been great to see how that impacts communities. Um, and uh, recently, just during the pandemic, I had spent some time working to help uh, uh, a homeless veteran uh, who had two dogs. And I have two dogs. And I, I anytime I see a homeless person with dogs, I usually give them some money. And um, I saw them after that last hurricane we had last year, um, like on Gandy Beach. So it looked like they'd slept out there during the hurricane and uh, ended up spending uh, some time working with him to take him to job interviews and get him um, in, in some programs to help him get on his feet. And uh, so that was really an eye opening experience. Um, and uh, that's kind of what led me down the path to um you know being here today and in a nutshell thanks chris yeah sure. okay tony if you could go maybe i think it's slide three probably I think if you just use the um, wheel on your mouse, it, it's a PDF, so it probably will just scroll down like a document would. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, <clears throat> so we were talking about the overarching goals of the continuum of care, which you'll often hear us called the COC. And um, one of our goals is to promote a community-wide commitment to end homelessness. That's why we have all of you here. We can't do that alone. Um, and it requires that we bring diverse people together to help us in homelessness. Our ultimate goal is that we quickly rehouse individuals and families, that we improve access to the use of mainstream resources, when you hear us use that term, mainstream resources usually means things like food stamps and other benefits that um, families and individuals may be eligible for, Medicaid, um, other programs that the federal and um, state and local government also offer that can help those that we serve. And optimally, our um, overarching goal is that we help people optimize self-sufficiency. So one of the things we heard over and over again in our racial disparity study was the idea that, hey, housing's great. I need a home, but more importantly, I need a job. And so we're doing more and more work towards this kind of workforce development side. There's programs in our community like Career Source that just isn't meeting the needs of um, those that we serve. So we have great partners like AGP, where Tawny works, that has some workforce development programs. We're doing some things, I know Boley and St. Vincent de Paul does as well, with the idea we've got to meet people where they're at because transportation is a barrier. Um, and we also have to be able to assess some folks are going to need assistance for the rest of their life. So if that's the case, let's get them connected to something um, like SOAR that can help them um, rapidly get um, disability and other um, resources, or maybe they have a job. And so if they have a job, but they know they're not ever going to be able to earn a sustainable wage, what can we do to help them um, you know, get certification 
like a CNA or something else where they can make a little bit more than they did before. Or if you've never had a job, we can help you enter into the workforce. And so those are some of the types of things that the continuum of care is responsible for under op optimizing self-sufficiency. Next slide, Tawny. Uh, so this particular slide is just kind of a visual representation that there's lots of components to an effective crisis response system. And none of it works with if any one of these pieces is missing. So I remember years ago when we started making the transition from transitional shelter to rapid rehousing and permanent supportive shelter, and everybody thought, oh, if this is HUD's focus, we don't need emergency shelter anymore. People are gonna go directly from the street into permanent housing. And while that's ultimately our goal, we know that's just not how our community is set up. So we're always gonna need emergency shelter, um, but we ultimately wanna move people to some of these other um, things you see here, like permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing. But we also believe that it's better if people um, never have to touch the system in the first place. So anytime we can prevent or divert people from homelessness, we should be doing that instead of having them enter shelter. We'll talk a little bit later about prevention and diversion services that HLA um, runs, but I'll say that for Pinellas County in particular, this is a new area that we have um, seen significant investment in, and we are hopeful to see more investment because we really see a difference. When you have 18,000 people come into your system in the county every single year, we need to be able to stop that water flow, right? Think of it like a bathtub. That you, No matter how much um, drain you pull out, if the water continues to flow, there's always water in the bathtub. But if we can turn off that faucet, it makes a big difference. And so I like to kind of liken prevention and diversion to that. And then many of you probably know about services we have in our community like street outreach where um, social workers are actually, you know, on the street looking for people who are homeless, asking them if they need assistance. And that's another component that's really important in a system. Next slide, Tony. So you're a part of the structure of our continuum of care. And so we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about that because this is where it gets really um, complicated as any government would um, have a system set up. So we have lots of representatives from relevant organizations in Pinellas County who come together and make decisions together about how our community should look and how the system of care to end homelessness should work. That COC membership then appoints a board. You're gonna be sitting on that COC board. Uh, that COC board then appoints a lead agency. That's the Homeless Leadership Alliance where I work. They also appoint an HMIS lead agency that is also at HLA right now in previous iterations that was held at 211. So sometimes they're not the same place. And then also something called the collaborative applicant. And that's the person or the entity that actually draws down the federal funds. Next slide. So this is kind of a, a visual representation to help you understand this. In years past, the nonprofit and the COC board were one and the same, but there's an inherent conflict of interest in that dynamic. And so we were one of the only COCs in um, the state of Florida that operated that way. So we did a lot of work to create um, some additional structure that allows there to be um, some more accountability for the Homeless Leadership Alliance. And so this visual representation should help you understand a little bit more about there's a nonprofit. For those of you familiar with somebody like St. Vincent de Paul or HEP or other providers in our community, the HLA is the nonprofit that is... Um, governed by things like bylaws and articles of incorporation. And there is a separate board that manages us as a nonprofit. All of those people sitting on that HLA board right now have served in the seats that you are sitting in today. 
So they're not people that are hands off, that don't understand this system. They've been providers. They've worked in the system. They've sat on the COC board. So the people who are helping guide the nonprofit understand what you on the COC side do as well. So above the COC um, board diagram, you see the COC membership. Anyone can join the COC. There's different um, fees based on whether you work for a nonprofit or you're just an individual who cares about ending homelessness. If you're formerly homeless, there's no fee. But people who care about making a difference in this area, they first become a member and then they get to vote on who represents them on the board. And then that board makes the policies about our system. That board is governed instead of in a nonprofit, um, which uses bylaws, that board is governed by a charter that they help write. You're going to get a copy of that after this meeting, but a lot of the information I'm presenting today comes directly from that charter. And then we have a lot of committees and really these arrows, somebody made this graphic and I can't edit it, I need to make a new one, should be pointing up instead of down. The COC board um, does not make decisions without the input of a lot of different committees and councils that inform what they do. So almost never does something go to the board first. It usually makes a couple stops along the way. So the people that are impacted by the policies that we have get to vet them, say, wait a minute, you know, I in implementation, this isn't going to work. And they inform and then the board votes on those various things. And you can see here in the graphic, there is an MOU that um, dictates the relationship between what does the HLA do to carry out the work of the COC, and then the COC board holds that nonprofit um, accountable for that work. Next slide. Hmm. I don't think that should be the next slide, but maybe it is. Um, go back one just in case, Tani. Okay, maybe it is. So let's talk about um, who is on the um, COC board seats. Again, this is something that's in the charter. Every year we're required to update the charter. So this looks different from year to year. The board determines you know, just like I mentioned earlier that we decided we really needed a transportation representative or somebody from workforce development to inform our work, they added a seat to make that happen. We also have a lot of veterans who are homeless in our system, and we didn't have a vet or a veteran organization sitting on our board. And so they added that seat this year, and that's how um, we got James. So this structure can change from year to year when we update the charter, but this is um, what it is right now. We have some at-large seats. We have businesses represented. Um, Chris is sitting in a business seat. We have faith-based organizations. We have the chair of the Funders Council and the chair of the Providers Council. They are elected by their own membership, and so the board doesn't actually vote on them because their memberships vote on them. Um, we have a healthcare representative. We have people who are formerly homeless or currently homeless. We have the housing authority, and then we have service experts. Next slide. And then we also have appointed government entities. I know I mentioned earlier that Costa um, from Tarpon Springs will be joining us whenever um, he can, but these seats are appointed by their government boards. And so we don't get to select who serves from these particular seats. So I wanted to mention them. We have a seat for the city of Clearwater, the city of Largo, the city of St. Pete, Pinellas Park, Tarpon Springs, the juvenile welfare board, the county commission, the school board, the sheriff, and the public defender. The CEO of the HLA also sits on the board as well, but it is a non-voting seat. So I attend every board meeting and inform the work that the COC board is doing, but I don't actually get a vote in how that work happens. Next slide. So I wanna pause there before we move on to committees and just see if there's any questions so far. 
And I can't see everybody's faces, so feel free to just unmute yourself if you have one. I had a quick question about the, um, well, what's it called? The, um, the organization that, ha that funnels the money through, is that HLA also? The lead agents. Yeah, so the, the money, com it, it, it's complicated, right? So that's what I said uh -huh. is government makes everything difficult. So we apply for the money, Tawny, but the money doesn't actually come through us. So the contracts that the individual providers hold, they hold it directly with HUD, not with us, but we have to apply for the money for them. Does that make sense? So it's like yeah. a sponsorship? Yeah, kind of. And so it makes it, you know, a lot of times when things don't work in the system, people will say, hey, why don't you make so-and-so do such and such? And it's like, that'd be nice if we held their contract. But since we don't write their contract, it's harder for us to hold various providers accountable to certain outcomes. Um, right. But we, we do that through written standards and, and other things that, um, you know, we monitor all of the programs for HUD. So HUD monitors us. And then we tell HUD, here's how our funded programs are doing, even though we don't get money from HUD directly. Um, but they want us to tell them how they're doing. Okay. Okay. Shannon has a question about why does JWB sit on the COC? Um, great question, Shannon. So JWB, it has about $80 million the last time I checked their budget. And um, they do a lot of work on the prevention side of homelessness. They don't like to delve into the deep end, as they call it. But, you know, we know that when children are homeless, it affects their learning outcomes and can um, cause child abuse and other things. And so they're, they kind of play in the realm of prevention to uh, keep families and children off the street. And so they get a vote because of the um, money that they invest in the system. Does that answer it? Okay, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the committees. Um, and you know, committees are really, and this is true in most nonprofits, they are really where all the work happens. Um, it, you know, when you get to a board meeting, there's, we usually have a very vibrant group who's going to discuss things, but sometimes you might be like, there's not a lot of discussion and this seems like a big issue. It's probably because it happened in a committee prior and that's where they really wrestle with topics. So by the time it's come to the board, it's been, um, vetted pretty thoroughly, oftentimes by multiple committees. So each of you as a board member are required to sit on a committee. I didn't wanna bombard you about that prior to this orientation. I figure let's let you go through the orientation, attend a couple of meetings, and then you and I can sit down one-on-one -on -one and determine where your passions lie and strengths and skills and where you might see your best fit. And you may say, I wanna visit a lot of committees and see where I think I can um, best serve. But I listed a couple of the committees um, that are in the charter. So when they're in the charter, they are governed by sunshine law here in the state of Florida, which means certain things. The meeting has to be held in person. The meeting has to be noticed to the public. We have to have minutes. And there's a bunch of other technicalities around sunshine law, like if Chris and Tawny um, wanted to go to lunch, they can do that, but they can't talk about anything that's coming up on a agenda in the future at the HLA. They can talk about other things, um, but that, you know, is the idea that no business takes place in the, the dark. So these are the committees. You can see there's a lot of them. So think of the COC as like the convener, the convener of all these different things that then inform um, the policies that the board, you um, sitting on the board, will help set. So we have a funders council, we have a providers council, we have an executive committee. You'll see four bullets under the executive committee. They can serve as these other four committees or they can appoint um, people to sit in those seats. They most often do that. So. 
Um, when it comes time for rank and review, it's not going to be everybody on the executive committee. They're going to make a call and say, who is eligible to sit on the rank and review? Rank and review, I probably should explain that, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later, but that's the terminology whenever we put out an RFP for HUD. Um, how we rank the grant applications and determine who's going to be at the top for funding and who isn't. Um, they can also serve as the grievance committee. So let's say somebody didn't get in the slot they thought they should have for funding. They could say they have a grievance and then they can um, serve in that role because usually a grievance committee has to come together very quickly or they can ask for um, volunteers to serve in that capacity. COC governance helps write the charter. It also helps um, determine who serves on the board. Again, um, it goes back and forth depending on timeline, but usually they'll ask other board members to sit in that capacity. And then um, strategic planning is another um, role that they can sit in or they can ask folks to sit in. We have a membership committee who helps us determine what the policies are around membership and also helps us recruit new members. We have a data and system performance committee. We're gonna talk a little bit later about how, what outcomes HUD holds us accountable for. And so there's the, the big outcomes that HUD is looking at but locally, this committee is looking at how are we performing locally and what should we set as those benchmarks? So you saw that in your board packet that we'll be going over on Friday. That committee like really digs deep down in the weeds and says, you know, our goal is that ending homelessness should be less than 75 days that somebody spends homeless. But locally, it's taking 90 because of the housing market. And so let's not set programs up for failure and they'll debate what number ultimately that should be. We also have the point in time um, county survey and planning committee. Point in time is coming up later this month. That is a requirement of HUD in order for us to be able to draw down the funds for programs that we do this annually. After the meeting, you will get the latest point in time count. We did not conduct a count last year um, because of the pandemic, HUD allowed COCs to waive that. So you're going to see uh, analysis of, I think, 2016 to 2020, and you, that's why 2021 is missing. We also have an advocacy committee that determines, you know, what policies we should be looking at, either at the local level or the state or federal level. A good example of that is right now there's some um, affordable housing policies that are on the um, slate for the legislature next year that um, don't look great, that take away the ability for some of our local governments to um, help get housing built. So that may be something the advocacy committee says, we want to take a stance on this and we want to ask the board to take a vote and an official stance so that then we can inform our representatives that we don't think that's a good law to pass. And then um, we also have a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. This group, I'm really proud of the work that they've been doing. Um, there are so many tools that are um, being created and rolled out of this committee. So this is a really active group. If you are really interested in how we make our response more equitable, this might be a place that you want to talk to me about learning a little bit more. Next slide. Okay, I told y'all we have a lot of meetings, right? I was telling Tani earlier before y'all joined that we are in back-to-back -back meetings all day, every day, oftentimes without enough time to run to the restroom. Um, so we also have a bunch of task force. These are groups that are not listed in the charter. So they can meet virtually. They don't have all the same um, requirements. They most of the time are noticed, but sometimes they need to happen quickly. Um, and this is the place that we often um, share client information. So I just share that as an example that like recently we had a emergency meeting around 52 families who were becoming homeless. The media asked to be a part of that meeting. 
we were able to tell them no, they could not attend because we were discussing HIPAA protected information in that meeting. And so this is kind of the um, dividing line that our attorney has helped us determine if it's in the charter, it's definitely sunshine. If it's a task force, that's really something that the HLA as a nonprofit is running to make the business of the system work. And when there's HIPAA protected information, we don't have to follow all of those same things. So we have by name list meetings, we have veteran task forces, we have a coordinated entry assessment work group. We're gonna talk about coordinated entry a little bit later. We have a meeting about the front door. So the front door is how people come into homelessness. We know right now, you hear all the time in our community, we called 211, they didn't do anything to help us. 211 is our front door to the system. So we have meetings a lot of times to talk about, okay, 211 can't do everything. So how do we need to build out this front door so that it works better for the clients that we're serving? We have family flow. We're redesigning what that flow should look like for families so that families aren't left on the street with no support at all while they're awaiting shelter. And a little bit later, we'll talk about something called Built for Zero that we're really excited to join um, that movement. But that's just another example of a task force where folks from various agencies are meeting together. Oftentimes, it's not the CEOs. It's more often the people who are, you know, boots on the ground doing that direct service work, working to make our system better. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to pause there for a minute about the structure and see if anybody has any questions so far. Not me. Okay, doesn't look like it. So let's talk about um, a little bit about what a COC actually does. And a little bit later, we'll also talk about what we do here at the HLA in addition to our COC work. So we develop those written standards. Those are things like, you know, what requirements um, help a shelter run the best with best practices, um, that other, you know, the National Alliance to End Homelessness and others have determined makes a smooth running shelter. Um, let me think of some other things in written standards. So, uh, you know, an example in written standards protects the safety of the clients that are being served. It'll say, you know, you have to have access to Wi-Fi when you're in a shelter because you need the ability to look for jobs. If you might be involved in child welfare, you need the ability to attend your child welfare meetings. And during the pandemic, that became really important because children needed access to Wi-Fi to attend school. So that's like a really granular idea of something that might be contained in a written standard. We also develop our community policies. Again, we don't do that on our own. You know. Things come up over time that somebody says, hey, this isn't working really well. And so then a policy will be developed to address that um, and it'll go through committees and then go to the board. We talked about those performance expectations that the data and system performance really um, committee works on. We'll show you some examples of what those are later. Um, so that's one of the things we do. And then we manage and ma monitor programs. So I mentioned earlier that we don't hold the contract, so it makes it a little hard sometimes to manage programs, but we do um, monitor for all the things the federal government is looking for. And then we provide that report, not only to the agency we're monitoring, we provide it to the board um, and HUD gets a copy of that in, um, their review of the individual programs application. So that's an area that we spend a lot of time on is kind of quality improvement. Next slide. So um, one of the biggest things we do every year, I called that rank and review earlier, we conduct the HUD grant process and I'm not going to go over these other bullets. I'm going to come back to them later because I want to show you some examples um, of what is allowable in the HUD grant process, because it's really important 
you know, a lot of times, and especially right now, there's so much money flowing into our community. Um, you know, one of the things I find there's a, I'm not going to remember the psychological term around it, but everyone will know what I'm talking about when I describe it. If you see a car accident and everybody rushes to the scene to help somebody, if somebody isn't tagged it and you say, Denise, I need you to go get help, then everybody's kind of looking at each other like, who does this? Who, you know, um, and so it's really important that you understand what HUD does, because I'm finding more and more, especially with all this money flowing into the community, our county and our cities and JWB and all of our private foundations that are involved, they'll say, okay, with this ARPA money, ARPA stands for the American Rescue Plan Act, we can build a shelter. So everybody's excited. Yes, we need family shelter. We're going to build that. But guess what? HUD doesn't fund emergency shelter. So, you know, you can't use local money that came down from the government to build shelter. You can, but then local money is going to have to fund that operation from year to year to year. And so we have a lot of conversations trying to braid all those monies and make all that work together. And so I want to focus on that for just a minute. So next slide. So here's who can apply for COC funds. Nonprofits and governments can apply. Um, For-profits are not allowed to apply or be subrecipients of grants. And again, these are HUD's guidelines, not ours. Um, and you must be designated by the COC to apply for these funds. So it's not like anybody can just go into this application. We're kind of the manager of the application. And based on who our rank and review says they can apply, then they get access to be able to do that. Next slide. So what qualifies for HUD money in this COC program that we're talking about with all these bureaucratic um, requirements? So I already mentioned HUD does not fund emergency shelter. So think of HUD on that end um, that I have in the green bullet, the permanent housing. They want to end homelessness. So anything that's going to last forever, they're willing to fund, but not so much on something that's temporary like um, emergency shelter. HMIS is another thing we do, and I'm not sure I explained that acronym earlier, so I want to mention it here. HMIS stands for the Homeless Management Information System. Think of that as the big database. Um, just like some of you may use an electronic health record um, where you work or other types of databases where they're shared information um, so that we can all serve the clients together. So let's say, Amy, I'm homeless and um, I'm touched by street outreach, which is currently held by Directions for Living. They can put in a note about Amy and then the next time somebody in the system sees Amy, I've presented to a um, soup program, a, a soup kitchen at St. Vincent de Palm North. If they were using HMIS, they could see and, oh, Amy's been on the street for a while. Street Outreach has talked to her. She's not ready for shelter yet. They could put in a note um, that, you know, kind of you get the idea, right? That it's a shared system. It is um, PPI, private protected information. And so you have to have a level two background screen in order to access HMIS, but all providers are required to use HMIS, not only by HUD, but all of our local funders in the community require people to enter into that system. And so HUD funds um, the infrastructure to that database. They um, you know, allow us money for staff to help support that work. You can also fund supportive services. This is an area where I don't feel like we have a um, ton of investment in our community, and I think we need to have more. Sorry, I see I have a typo here from multitasking, um, adding some of this earlier, but the types of things that would fall under supportive services would be things like workforce development, child care support, things that help somebody on their path um, to becoming housed that isn't necessarily housing focused. 
The next um, particular type of intervention is something that we used to have a whole bunch of in our system and we have less and less of it. So this is an area that HUD has asked us to move away from. Transitional housing typically um, used to be the model of how we supported homeless people. You'd go into a program, you'd have a bunch of requirements. You had to usually be involved. Two years was about the average time frame with transitional housing. And then HUD realized that you couldn't move enough people through a system where they had to stay two years and that everybody deserves housing. Housing is a human right. You shouldn't have to come into the system ready for housing. And so they started moving away from this particular model. But I think as a community in Pinellas County, when we moved away from this model, there became a message that transitional housing is never allowed. And that's not true. Transitional housing is particularly important for our domestic violence clients takes them a little bit longer to get on their feet. And also for people who are newly sober or tenuously sober. So we know <coughs> that the idea of housing first matters. Um, and that idea is that people don't have to do anything to deserve housing. It's kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? That you can't self-actualize unless you have a roof over your head. And so we're going to focus on getting you housed, and then we'll focus on your mental health issues or workforce development, help that you may need, um, you know, other types of case management and supports that you may need. Now, it doesn't mean, by the way, a lot of people take housing first and say, we just house people. That's all we do. That's not what housing first means. You still have to have all those wraparound supports to make people successful. Um, and, and we know that folks need good case management and they need drug treatment and they need um, mental health supports and all of those things. It just means that can't be a barrier for them to enter a program. And then we've talked a lot about um, permanent housing already. There are two types of that in our system. One is called rapid rehousing. My best way to describe rapid rehousing is where a client is placed in an apartment and provided a short-term subsidy, six months, a year, up to two years sometimes to help them get on their feet. But they're living out in the community um, with everybody else. They're still getting that case management and support, but they're not living in one um, location. In permanent supportive housing, you more often see that where everyone's living in one complex. This is a lot of bully properties. HEP has a lot of per permanent supportive housing options. So, you know, you live in one place, you're able to get your health care, your mental health care, everything kind of infused at um, one location. There is um, some new models from HUD about doing permanent supportive housing in what they call scattered site. And we as a community have started to explore that with funders um, and help them understand the pros and cons so that you know, they have new um, ideas of ways that they may fund things differently than they may have done in the past whenever they wanna support something that maybe didn't get funded by HUD. Next slide. Okay, and this is really in the weeds, but these are the eligible activities. So I just wanted to mention that because a lot of people will ask, well, can we fund operations or can you fund administration? So with funds that um, HUD allows for the CFC, you can do acquisition, rehabilitation, or new construction. You can do rental assistance, and you can do operation cost and administrative costs. So those are the types of activities that those um, interventions could include in a budget for their COC application. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna pause there for a second because I know that was a lot of information and it's one of the biggest things we do that people have questions about. So any questions about conducting the HUD grant process? I had a quick question, Amy Thross. Um, when you talked about reviewing, um, I don't know the exact terms of the slide, but we're basically reviewing which, uh, who is eligible for funding. Is that a committee comprised entirely of HLA staff or do you have other people on there as well? 
That's a great question. So it is not HLA staff. We do um, kind of some initial vetting, I would say, where, you know, we're checking that people followed the NOFO. Um, NOFO stands for Notice of Funding Opportunity that was put out, that they met the deadlines and that kind of thing. And then we forward that on to a committee of board members that actually are the ones that rank the um, applications and make the ultimate decision. And, and I should say they make a decision and then the CSC board has to ratify their recommendation. So no committee makes decisions on their own. Um, everything that happens at the committee level then goes up to the CSC board to make a final decision. Does that help Ross? Yes, thanks Amy. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we also provide training and technical assistance. So you can imagine that all of this bureaucracy that I just described can get really confusing to programs, especially right now in COVID. Every day, a new what HUD calls a waiver comes out that will say, you used to not be able to do this and now you can do this. Or, hey, we want to be able to provide um, you know, some kind of incentive for homeless people to get vaccinated. Here's how you do that and the, all the regulations around how you do that. So we have to help all of our providers in our community understand all of those rules. So we provide that training and then also are the ones they call when they need one-on-one -on -one assistance. Like, hey, I have this client in my office. Can I do this or can I not? And so we'll go through all those standards, make sure they're complying with the HUD um, regulations. So they don't have somebody at HUD that they can call. We're their intermediary and help them understand um, how to do all of that implementation. And then earlier we talked about kind of that advocacy focus that we have. Um, and when I say outreach here, I don't mean outreach like street outreach. I mean outreach to bring new members into the system that can help us in homelessness. So. Um, you know, folks like Chris, who, you know, works at a business, but builds affordable housing, we know that housing is the solution to homelessness. So we need people like Chris and Raymond James at the table to help us solve this problem. And so we do that kind of outreach, not um, street outreach, where we're directly serving clients in that way. And then one of the biggest things um, that we do, and I'm going to focus on this one for a few minutes as well, is coordinate the strategic planning. So I mentioned earlier, there's all this money flowing into the system right now. Every single different funding source um, has different requirements. So for example, um, there's a funding source called ESG CV right now that stands for Emergency Solution Grant. CV stands for COVID. Um, that particular funding source allows certain activities and you can serve anybody 50% AMI and lower with that. AMI stands for uh, median income, um, average median income. Um, so, you know, that has one requirement. Then there's another program called CDBGCV. That's Community Development Block Grant. CV again is for COVID. That goes up to 80% AMI, and it has totally different requirements. Then we have ARPA, which is the American Rescue Plan Act. Right now, Congress is voting on the Build Back Better plan. All of those funding sources <laughs> allow you to do different things with different people. And so we have a bunch of meetings that weren't outlined in all those committees um, that I outlined earlier that help us figure out how we braid all of those sources to make sure there's no gaps in our system. So we'll be doing things like looking at the data to say, you know what, right now we have enough rapid rehousing money, but we don't have any money for emergency shelter. Hey, local governments, HUD's not gonna fund emergency shelter. We need you to do that. So let's take a little bit deeper dive in strategic planning. Next slide, Tani. So um, these are some of the things that we do under strategic planning. There's a bunch of other things, um, but I did want to mention this particularly for Costa, who um, didn't get to join us, but will be able to view the recording. Um, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about the COC 
is that HUD actually requires that we participate in the city and county consolidated plans process. So that consolidated plan process is basically like a big strategic planning document that counties and cities do. They often hire consultants to do it for them that says, here's how our community told us they want to end homelessness, to you know, put money in soup kitchens, to um, make sure we have prevention dollars. They write that plan, it goes up to HUD, and then no other programs can get can happen without it being written into that plan. So we not only participate in that by informing what's get, what gets written down, but then we also are required to sit on the funding committees at the city and county levels that determine who gets the money from those consolidated plans. And once again, in this you know, bureaucratic um, structure, we don't hold the contracts but we are supposed to be monitoring those contracts and saying, hey, city of St. Pete, you funded, you know, so-and-so with the ESGCB money. They're not spending it. And we need you to ask more questions and do X, Y, and Z to fix that. So, you know, a, a lot of layers, um, which is kind of commonplace in government, unfortunately. We just talked about the planning for incoming resources and alignment with needs, but we also are working really hard right now to remove duplications and streamline responses. So in a few minutes, when we talk about what the HLA does, you're gonna see kind of a system map of a lot of different interventions. Some of them HLA does, some of them other providers do. But again, we have to remember that these are human beings navigating a system and when it's that complex, um, nobody can make it through on their own. And so we're taking a deep dive every day into different, you know, right now we're looking at veterans. We just finished our family flow and saying, look at this. We can't even fit it on one page. All the people a family has to talk to, to get housed. And there's 92 steps. How can we make that 50 steps or less? And so... <clears throat> That's a lot of, of the work we've been doing this year and that you'll see us doing in the next couple of years as well. Next slide. Okay, so um, these are just a few more things. We report to the local, state, and federal entities. We already talked about administering this database where everybody's information is kept and helping people run reports out of that so they know um, what's happening in the system. We'll talk a little bit later about coordinated entry and why um, we believe coordinated entry is an important component of the system. So we implement that. And we also have housing navigation, navigation and prevention and diversion services. So I'm gonna pause there. We're gonna um, look a little bit deeper at the HLA but let me see if there's any questions about what the COC does so far. Those city plans, the city's plans mm -hmm. and homelessness, how many cities are we talking about? Yeah. Um, so almost every city that has a seat on the board has a consolidated plan. So they call them entitlement communities, Tawny. Okay. And um, like Pinellas Park is an entitlement community, but Safety Harbor is not. Okay. So um, I want to say there's five or six, but Clearwater is, Pinellas Park is, Largo is, St. Pete is, and then anybody not covered in what's called an entitlement community, the county covers. So we've okay. got to inform all of those various areas. Um which is, you know, a lot of coordination. <laughs> yeah. Chris, did you have something? Oh, um, yeah, I was just wondering the, the question. So it's each, each community has its own plan. Yeah. Each community. Okay. Yeah. And then does each um, major metro like MSA have its own COC? Yes. Great question, Chris. So um, every you know, COC is structured a little bit differently, but locally, let's just look at us. Pinellas County is one um, COC, Holt, or I'm sorry, Pasco County is a COC. 
Hillsboro is a COC. When you get to some of the smaller communities, you'll see, you know, multiple counties in one COC, um, but usually they're guided kind of by an MSA area. Good question. Okay, thanks. And there's nothing from HUD that um, says that, for example, that Pinellas, Hillsborough, and Pasco couldn't merge together. So those are some things that I would imagine, you know, as time goes on, maybe looked at. Um, but so HUD doesn't determine the um, geographic structure like initially. Yeah. Sure. Any other questions? Okay, so I just want <clears throat> to give you a reminder here that everything that we do as the HLA serving as the CSC um, is dictated by HUD, that CSC charter, which you're going to get a copy of, and the MOU between the HLA and the CSC board. So it's not like HLA can go off willy nilly and decide to do something on our own, right? And that's one of the challenges sometimes I have. Um, with staff, right? We can have a really great idea. Somebody said something the other day they wanted to do, and it was an advocacy thing that we probably should do. But because we have all these layers, we weren't nimble enough to be able to say, yeah, staff, go ahead and go to this council meeting and advocate for this thing because we needed the COC to take that stance and tell us as HLA we could do that. So um, a little... Um, onerous at times, but uh, it also helps make sure the whole community has buy-in in what we're doing. So next slide, Tony. Okay, so this is a map of the crisis response system. Um, I just wanted to use this not to go through the map, but to show you um, what HLA does. So where there is a red circle, I don't envision that HLA will ever do programs in this area. So that's um, interventions like transitional housing, emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing, um, things like that. That's not our wheelhouse, right? We're the, the administration and there was a time where people believed that HLA should never, ever do any intervention or programs. But over time, we learned that certain activities work best at the system level. And so where you see the green areas are where the nonprofit um, has interventions and programs that support the COC that are separate from our COC responsibilities. But only because those things happen better at a system level. So, you know, we don't do um, 211, but access to the system, we do have people call us and ask for help. We have to have ways to help people figure out where do they go for help. Um, prevention and diversion, we do some of that work. We are responsible for um, coordinated entry, and we really don't have many supportive services. I mentioned we've been looking at doing more workforce development. We have a pilot program on that right now funded by ESGCV dollars that will end in June. Um, but I, you know, if we were to delve anywhere else, it would be in that supportive services area and not in any of the, um, I'll just call kind of case management intervention areas that you see uh, in the red circle. That is not true for every COC. There are COCs who build their own affordable housing. This is the structure that our community has asked for us um, to participate in. But in some COCs, they do it all. That's not um, what we do here in Pinellas. Next slide. Okay, any, any questions about the HLA? That's just like a super low level quick entry, but since you're COC board members, I wanted to focus mostly on the COC, but I wanna pause and see if there's any questions about um, programs that the HLA may run. Do we get to see the MOU between the COC and the HLA? 
Yep. And it's reviewed every year by the board and um, determined. So right now we're in a three-year agreement, Tawny, and I think it ends either this year or next year. But every year when you update the charter, it's reviewed again. And, um, you know, kind of everybody gets a reminder that this is when it's going to expire so that we get a new contract um, in time before it expires. And anything that want, maybe you want changed around it. Other questions? Okay, so let's look at those system um, performance measures. This is what we have to report out to HUD. And we use a lot of other measures locally as well, but these are the ones that HUD cares about. So they want the length of time homeless to be as small as possible, right? HUD believes that you should be able to go from the street to housing. We believe that as a value. We just know, again, as a community, that's not how it um, often works. But we want that to be shorter and shorter, right? We know that people experience trauma when they have to live in congregate settings um, and when they have to be transient. Maybe kids are having to move schools, that kind of thing. So we want that length of time homeless as short as possible. We also want to reduce the number of people who are homeless. So I, people always, their mouths drop open. I know, you know, when I am talking to folks, you would never know that in a community like Pinellas County, 18,000 people are coming into our system every single year. It's a lot of people. So we want that number to reduce. Again, I believe prevention and diversion is one of the best ways to reduce that number. It also reduces trauma. Um, and so that's something that um, HUD measures annually. It's also one of the reasons that we look at the point in time count, right? Not a very accurate count. It's a one day snapshot, but that's why we're required to do that. They wanna see on any given day, how many people are in the system. Income growth, we talked about the overarching goal of a CUC program is to optimize self-sufficiency. And so income growth is something they look at. Now, this is one of those weird things that, um, you know, one thing affects another and it, it matters. So they look at earned income and unearned income. So unearned income is things like we helped you get access to food stamps. We helped you get connected to Medicaid, things like that. As unearned income, or sorry, as earned income goes up, unearned income goes down, right? But it's one of the things that they look at both of those measures. And we certainly want earned income to go up, but we also know some people are never gonna be able to earn income. And so we need to be able to track that we're connecting people to those resources. We also look at recidivism. So our kind of recidivism mark for our community, as well as for HUD is two years. So we're hoping that if we help somebody that they don't come back into the system for at least another two years. So we look at that um, in almost every meeting where we look at data. Next slide. So we also look at the number of people who are homeless for the first time. Um, this is an area that I'm really interested in seeing more about during the pandemic. As we've been increasing our prevention resources, are we keeping people from becoming homeless who've never been homeless before? Because of our housing crisis, are we seeing more people who are homeless that never would have been homeless before, but their rents went up and they had nowhere else to go? and our market's so tight, they're not able to find another unit. So this is an area that I think um, in the coming months as board members, you'll see us pay a lot of attention to. We look at retention of permanent housing, right? Whenever somebody's put into permanent supportive housing, are they able to retain it? And if, if they aren't, what are we doing to wrap supports around them to stabilize them again, instead of them having to become homelessness again? We look at successful placement from street outreach into housing um, and then successful placement in permanent housing. So you'll see these numbers presented. Um, they present to the board at least quarterly. They are always available. We use a system called Tableau. That's a data visualization tool. 
They are always available on the website and you can actually play with it and look at, you know, let's say you're writing a grant or you want to know how many people are first time homeless. You can get that um, information in real time on our website at any time. Next slide. Okay, so let's pause there for a minute. Any questions about um, performance outcomes? Okay, we're gonna go on to who can be funded by COC programs. And I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but I do want you to understand because this is one of the most frustrating things that I think all of us, I know I can't see any staff faces right now, but I know um, if we were just among staff, it's something I hear from people all the time. Like this is crazy making. What? So we get calls, people will say, I'm in a hotel right now, I'm about to become homeless, I need help. Well, guess what? HUD doesn't allow us to do that. Um, so you have to be literally homeless on the street in order for any program to be able to assist you. So there are four categories of homelessness. They all have very specific government definitions. Um, <clears throat> and so depending on how their program is funded, some programs you have to be literally homeless for their financial assistance to be able to pick up. And this is how HUD defines that. So you lack a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence, you're sleeping in a place not meant for habitation like your car or the woods, or you're currently in shelter. So let's look at category two, because this is an area that um, can be applied. Again, it depends on the funding source. Some funding sources allow us to help people who are at imminent risk of homelessness. So that means maybe I'm in a hotel and I'm gonna lose my residence in the next 14 days. Maybe I've just gotten an eviction letter from my landlord. Um, you also have to not have any other supports available. So when we talk about diversion, one of the things that diversion does is we're having a conversation with a client we're trying to determine, Tani, do you have an aunt that could help you? And Tani says, no, I really don't. You know, my aunt's overwhelmed already. She has three kids herself. And then we're able to say, well, what if we helped your aunt pay the light bill or we gave her some grocery money? So anybody who has supports and networks, they are not considered at imminent risk of homelessness. And this is one of the biggest frustrations I know staff and others experience in our community is this idea that why do we have to make people homeless in order to help them? So, you know, this is one of those things. There's a lot more to this definition, but I wanted um, to mention this. This is one of the things, anytime I'm negotiating um, solutions with our local funders, I'm always talking about, you know, please make sure that you allow um, the scope of work to include serving people who are at imminent risk because we wanna keep people from becoming homeless anytime we can. Next slide. This one, I'm not gonna go over. It is pages of federal regulations that is um, way too deep to get into, but I do always present it because um, this particular one cares about families um, and unaccompanied youth 25 and under. So those are kids who may have aged out of foster care, uh, maybe are young parenting mothers. And so there's a really tricky de definition to category three. Most providers in our community do not use category three for um, qualifying someone as homeless. So I'm not gonna review it, but there is a um, category three. If you ever hear people say, oh, they're, they're a category one, they're a category two, they're talking about the federal regulation for how their homelessness is defined. Next slide. And then category four is anyone who's fleeing domestic violence. Same kind of restrictions though. You can't have an alternative place identified. You have to lack support and networks and um, alternatives that will be somewhere that maybe you could go. Um, this has a little bit of um, wiggle room in it that it doesn't always have to be domestic violence as um, we might traditionally picture that. 
um, this other dangerous situations related to violence. I'll use an example. I had a constituent in the city of St. Pete who um, had a home invasion and was raped. That um, person came back to their home multiple times. They qualified for homeless services because of this other dangerous situations until the police were able to find that person and put them behind bars, which they ultimately did. But that's, it wasn't like a boyfriend or a family member or anybody that the person knew, but it was a um, situation that allowed for them to be classified as homeless using this um, categorization. Next slide. Okay, and then um, there's also specific regulations around who is chronically homeless. So I always think chronically homeless means somebody who's been homeless a long time. That's not what the federal definition means. You have to be homeless for a certain period of time um, and you have to have a disability. So you can be homeless for a long time and not qualify for the supports that are available for people who are chronically homeless. And there's a lot of paperwork that goes behind qualifying somebody as chronically homeless. So this is something that our navigator folks have spent a lot of time on in the past is helping somebody with permanent supportive housing actually qualify as chronically homeless and document that they were homeless for different times um, over the last three years, things like that. Next slide. Okay, so let's take a quick look at coordinated entry and we're getting close on time, but I'm gonna talk fast. Um, coordinated entry is run by the HLA and um, the best way for me to describe coordinated entry is it's not first come first serve. It's the idea that the people who need the help the most get help first and then we work our way to less vulnerable people. Um, this slide sums up to me why I believe so strongly in coordinated entry is before if you were homeless and I went to HEP, they may have one form and assessment, um, you know, and then I went to St. Vincent de Paul, they had a different form and assessment. I was having to tell my story over and over and over again. Now we have one assessment called the VI SPDAT that every single program use, uses. So this is a person-centric idea and not a program-centric idea. Um, it also requires us as a community to agree on who is the most vulnerable? Who do we wanna serve <laughs> first? Next slide. Go ahead to the next slide. So our assessment in Pinellas County is called the VI SPDAT. You'll hear that in board meetings a lot. That stands for the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision and Assessment Tool. We are looking for a new tool in our community because this tool, um, which is what most communities nationwide use, uses, has been proven to cause racial disparities. So we have a whole committee meeting to find a new tool and how that's going to work. But right now, this is the tool that we use. You don't need as a board member to understand these details that individuals get a VI SPDAT after 14 days. Families have to be assessed within 72 hours. But you'll hear that come up in policy decisions. So I just wanted you to kind of have a preview that this is what we're talking about. Now, you can imagine that the reason there may be different um, timelines for when we spadat somebody, you'll hear people use that term, is because we don't have enough family shelter. And so we, whenever a family becomes homeless, we also know that there are additional risk when there are minor children involved. We've got to get them assessed quickly and figure out what we're going to do with them. Individuals, we always have enough shelter beds in our community. May not be the kind that we want, right? Tawny was talking earlier about having a pet. Um, you know, we know that we need to be able to define families more broadly. We know that we need places that people can bring their pets. <clears throat> but based on HUD's look at our bed rate, utilization rate is what they call it. They say, you know what, individuals, let's, let's give them a little while and let them self-resolve. And so that's why you see here that they have 14 days before they're assessed because they may be able to go sleep on the couch with a friend, 
um, or some other kind of alternative solution. Next slide. Street outreach has completely different rules for VI Spadat. I don't need to go over that, but I just wanted you to know that again, you know, there and these are policies that the COC board makes. So they can change from time to time. And I'd say some of these things change annually based on how our system is flowing. Next slide. I already mentioned this is not first come first serve. So this is our current prioritization scheme. Again, we have a committee meeting right now to determine, is this really how we should prioritize people? So we prioritize people who have disabilities as the folks who should um, be helped first. And then um, you, you kind of go from there. So there are other things that VI Spadat actually has a score. People get a number. That number shouldn't be used as like the end all be all. We need to take a lot of other information in about a person to understand them and where they fit in their vulnerability. But this is the written standard for um, how we prioritize people. Next slide. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna not talk about Built for Zero because we only have um, five minutes left, but I will at least say there is a national movement of people trying to end homelessness. Um, they have done it. There's 80 communities that have participated in this. I think 18 have ended homelessness. We just joined, so we are working as a community with a bunch of different providers to end chronic homelessness in Pinellas County. And they help us learn how to do that based on how other communities did it. So I'm not going to go through these next couple of slides, but I just want you to know that's happening. So if you hear us at a future board meeting talk about Built for Zero, we've basically joined like a cohort of other communities working to end homelessness. We've chosen to focus on chronic individuals, um, and we'll be telling you more about that in the future. I think the last slide, Tony, is just my contact information, which most of you um, should have. As I mentioned, I'm gonna send you quite a few things after the meeting. <clears throat> I'm gonna send you the current charter. Um, and the charter, again, is what dictates our, our work and the board determines what that looks like. I'm gonna send you the COC board meeting schedule. I'm gonna send you a roster of the people who are on the board, just so you have their contact information should you need it. I'm gonna send you that glossary, again, just kind of handy, but at any board meeting, stop, ask me questions, tell me to explain an acronym. And then I'm gonna send you the last point in time count analysis, and then a whole bunch of standards. So there'll be the written standards, the coordinated entry policy and procedure book, and the HMIS policy and procedure book, probably things you're never gonna need as a board member, but in the future, you'll be approving new versions of those things. So I like you to just have them. And then, you know, when we have one-on-one -on -one meetings, as you have questions, feel free um, to say, hey, I was wondering how this works or that kind of thing. So I know that's a lot of information in a short amount of time. I'm available one-on-one -on -one to answer questions. This is my personal cell phone. Feel free to use it. I am known not to carry my work cell phone as often as I should. So don't distribute this to clients, but do not ever hesitate to um, text or call my personal cell phone. Um, any questions that I can answer quickly, I do like to try to start and end on time. Uh, I don't have any questions, but this was really great uh, and informative. So I appreciate it. I'm glad you were able to join us, Chris. Yeah, me too, for sure. Any other questions? No questions, uh, just thanks. So I'll mention, um, I've sat on boards where the CEO um, went through every agenda with me prior to the meeting. I felt like that was a little more handholding than I needed. But do not hesitate. So I am not going to schedule time to go over your agenda with you prior to every board meeting. But seriously, we always send the agenda out a week in advance. Don't ever hesitate to shoot me a message and say, can I get a few minutes on your calendar? I have questions. I don't understand something. I'd like some one-on-one -on -one time. 
happy to do it. I just know that everybody's working their day jobs and people are overwhelmed. I don't want to add more meetings to your schedule than is necessary, but I'm always here to answer questions or assist in any way I can. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much, Tony, for um, helping share the slides. No problem. Bye, everybody. Bye. So long. Have a great day. Bye, guys.